Okay, today we're going to talk about the third stage of the Russian Civil War, and that is the Peasant War. Before we get there, I want to finish on the Dinikin Offensive and the collapse of the White uh, Offensive, uh, General Dinikin. We finished the story with October 1918, when... Uh, his armies are standing 200 kilometers from Moscow, asking him what he's going to do when he comes to Moscow. He promises that there'll be fair elections, he's going to run for elections. To what extent was there a real possibility of Dinikin victory? It seems like there was a chance. It was not a big chance, but there was a chance that he might win. Uh, and in fact, the Bolsheviks were preparing the... Um, passports to leave uh, and in case things went bad. But then there were several factors that worked against Dinikin, uh, and, and, and these are these factors. Number one, his relations with peasants were not really good. Uh, as the white army was advancing, uh, the peasants were suspicious of the whites because they heard rumors of executions of the witch hunt against the communists and commissars and Soviets, and some of them had anything to do with the Soviets, at any point they were afraid of the white uh, coming to their villages. The second reason it was weakening is that uh, the Cossacks, who were a big part of the volunteer army, or allies with the volunteer army of the officers, they had the second thoughts about going too far from their native villages. Uh, once they were fighting for their villages, for their power in their villages against the Bolshevik requisitioning, against decozakization, they were fine, they were defending their land. But once they were three, four, five hundred kilometers away, they were not particularly interested in putting their utmost effort into the white victory. So this is the second reason. And the third reason, and the most important, is the capacity of the Bolshevik regime to mobilize. Uh, they were superb in organization and mobilization. They would come to any village and create the committee of this, the committee of that. The Bolsheviks really were unsurpassed masters of mobilization, propaganda, agitation. They were professionals, they were doing it all their lives, and they were good at putting uh, an army to... Uh, they were putting their army in action uh, once the offensive began. So in that sense, the Bolsheviks were uh, superior in their capacity to uh, mobilize uh, for the offensive. So finally, uh, they did mobilize 200,000 men, which really was more than what Dinikin had, and they started their offensive, uh, which broke the front, and by December 1918, the Bolsheviks uh, were in full command of the south of Russia, the, the volunteer army was in full retreat. And in the book, I have a fascinating report of a British uh, journalist, a British pilot, who gave it to a British journalist. And the pilot recorded uh, observing from the air, as he thought, tens of thousands of people streaming down the roads, carrying all their possessions and carts and things, escaping the Bolshevik rule. So they were... Uh, Cossacks, they were intellectuals, they were property owners, they were all kinds of people. They were all going the south, and there are incredible images from the French sources how they were all trying to get on boats and fighting for their place in boats, and many of them were left behind. But the statistics is that uh, in this period of 1919, 1920, two million Russians left Russia after this uh, collapse of the white regimes. Uh, two million, and they were the flower of the nation. They were writers, poets, musicians. Uh, they were really the, the most educated, the most talented part of Russian society, and they all left. Most of them wound up in Paris, uh, but they were Russian community. In any case, Denikin's army is done, and the uh, for the remainder of it is uh, stuck in Crimea for another year uh, that they're uh, in, in Crimea under General Vrangel. But basically, for our purposes, the white cause is over, they lost, and the next stage of the civil war, and finally, uh, in 1991, I went to 
uh, Russian archives as soon as they were opened after the collapse of communist rule, and I documented some of the uh, incredible uh, pages of Russian history from the peasant resistance to them. So let me explain what I mean by the peasant war. Uh, it is, uh, uh, I call in the book, the frontline civil war and the non-frontline civil war. This is why the book is called Behind the Front Lines of the Civil War. The front lines are like an American civil war. You have a front line. On this line is this army, on that line is that army. They're engaged in battle, and when the army wins or loses, the other side advances and controls territory and establishes government authority. That is the model of an American civil war. And that was pretty much the way it was with the civil war between the Reds and the Whites, when one of them would advance or uh, w withdraw their troops and the other would advance, establish government authority. Not so with the peasant war. I argue in this book that the peasant war was going on in every Russian village of Central European Russia, everywhere, regardless of whether there was a front line. There was a civil war of a different kind, and that is what we're going to talk about now. What kind of a civil war was it? It was what I call in the book a war of peasant resistance against participation in the civil war. What I mean by that is that the peasants didn't want to fight. They didn't want to fight in a Bolshevik war or in a white war, so they resisted, draft to the Red Army. And that resistance is overlooked. Uh, and I discovered incredible documents in the archives, which was a report of the Cheka, the secret police, Dzerzhinsky's uh, extraordinary commission to Lenin, describing the activities of a Cheka train that went around the central provinces of Russia in uh, July 1919. And in that report, they basically describe that they have liquidated gangs of green deserters, as they were called, and they were numbering them in one province only, in one province alone, 90,000, according to the Cheka source. So if, if this was going on, and it was going on, not just in one province, but in all the provinces of central Russia, that would give us hundreds of thousands of peasant rebels hiding in the villages, uh, and fighting the Bolsheviks. Fighting or not, it depends, we'll talk about it. But they were definitely uh, a part of green resistance. Uh, uh, and they, they were much bigger than anything else around. The Dinikin army was 150,000. The Kolchak's army was 100,000. So I argue that the peasant rebels who were fighting the Bolsheviks were several times bigger than the white armies combined. That's the point. Now then the question, did they actually fight or did they not? And here is the answer. They did and they didn't, depending on what their goals were. So I distinguish between several types of green peasant rebels. The, there are the, uh, the deserters is the biggest one. And the deserters are there not necessarily to fight, but many of them just hide in the villages and avoid the draft. They, their goal is not to be drafted. If they are attacked directly by, you know, Cheka train that is sent to liquidate the deserters, then they fight back, obviously they do, and in that case we have a, a detachments of Greens, of deserters, who fight the Bolsheviks. And obviously this was in the tens of thousands. But even bigger group were those that were hiding in the forests, and that's why they were called Greens, and their purpose was to hide, not from, from, from draft, but to hide from grain requisitioning. Because the Bolsheviks, as we know, sent a requisitioning detachment to the villages to collect the grains from the rich peasants because they needed to feed the cities. That's what they said. Well, what could feed the cities by supply and demand, by good prices, by trade? Trade is no good. It's capitalism. It's abolished. Therefore, you have to go and take the grain by force. And that's what they did. So the peasants of this category do not want to fight. 
All they want is keep their grain, their families, and their villages without being attacked. And therefore, they could not be counted as uh, fighting against the Bolsheviks. They basically fight only if they're forced to. If they're forced to, they resort to fighting. What do they do? They, they, they hoard the grain, they hide the grain. If the Bolsheviks discover it, then they fight uh, in a kind of a retroactive fashion to attack the requisition detachments, kill the commissars, distribute back the grain that was requisitioned. So their defensive action is designed to uh, protect them from Bolshevik requisitioning. Continued their resistance in 1918. It goes much bigger in 1919. It reaches even higher level of resistance in 1920. Moreover, one can argue that in 1920, the Bolsheviks have uh, entered the the most gruesome, the most the most cruel and bloodthirsty period of the uh, peasant war. Now, the most famous of these episodes is the civil war uh, with peasants in Tambov province. That there are books written about it. Recently I reviewed a big, thick German book by a German scholar.